Christmas is not the only focus of celebration today here on Radio 4. There's also an important upcoming birthday for the network, 70 years of the Archers. So we've decided to take a festive peek behind the scenes in Ambridge and meet some of the cast in real life as they choose favourite pieces of writing and music in With Great Pleasure at Christmas. Hello and welcome to Ambridge and this festive celebration marking 70 years of the Archers. My name's Charles Collingwood, although you may know me better as Brian Aldridge. And along with six other members of the Archers cast, I'll be sharing a favourite piece of writing with you, odd piece of music, some stories from behind the scenes perhaps. A bit of deep background of which there's a lot after 70 years of Ambridge life. So. I'd like you to join us here in the village this Christmas. Imagine snow is falling in the Borsetshire countryside. There are Christmas lights all around the green. I've just been for a brisk walk across the fields of home farm, but now I'm back in front of an open fire with a hot toddy in my hand. Brian, he's been a bit of a womanizer. I mean, he, he was always known as the J.R. of Ambridge. He had a wandering eye. I remember years ago when Vanessa said to me, Brian's going to get a wandering eye, he's going to be this, he's going to be that. I said, well, please don't make him just one direction. Don't just make him bad. Nobody's quite like that. And so Brian, he's been a good father, a good businessman. He loves Jennifer. He's worked hard for his family. That's been his main drive. Unfortunately, just every now and again, He's uh, wanted a little bit of uh, fun elsewhere. In 2002, the autumn, I had a rather dodgy hip. It needed to be replaced, and it, it coincided with, of course, Brian not worrying about his hips because he was in the middle of his steamy affair with Siobhan. And in the November, everything was going his way. Jennifer had no idea. The family had no idea. He felt that his relationship with Siobhan could go on forever while remaining a wonderful husband to Jennifer. This story did catch the listener's imagination, and I was telephoned by Rachel Johnson, quite out of the blue, sister of our current Prime Minister, Boris and asked to go and meet her for breakfast. Well, I was delighted. And as I walked into this cafe in Hampstead at about half past eight in the morning, she put out her hand to shake mine, and I noticed she blushed slightly, and honestly, journalists don't blush very often. And she said, before we do this interview, Charles, I must just tell you that I rang my mother, and I said, Mother, you may like to know, I'm having breakfast with Charles Collingwood, who plays Brian Aldridge. And my mother said to me, Oh, do be careful, darling. Well, of course, actually, Rachel was looking at me then and she knew how safe she was. Uh, but it was uh, it was just one of the indications that this story was having a bit of an effect, and indeed on Christmas Day, the Bishop of Sherburne, who was preaching in Wimborne Abbey that morning, used Brian and his story with Siobhan as part of his sermon, and there was an audible hiss from the congregation. <laughs> I wish I'd heard it. Well, a number of people will know that um, Judy Bennett, who plays Shula and is my wife in real life, we had a touring show called Laughter and Intrigue. And the piece I've chosen to read is a piece that Sir Richard Stilgo, one of my oldest and dearest friends, very kindly wrote for us as an opening for our stage show. Charles and Judy are both actors, an honourable profession, a glorious vocation, a magnificent obsession which begins with dreams of Hamlet, Desdemona, Lear, Camille, and listen for the telephone to peal. Twelve months later, we reflect upon the actor's bitter pill. I've died in Holby City, been run over in the bill. Judy played a junior midwife in the series they aborted, said one word in EastEnders which predictably was sorted. So imagine our relief when, over coffee and focaccia, Tony Shryan said, we'd like you each to be an archer. We're no longer Charles and Judy. Judy Shuler, I am Brian. And Vanessa Whitburn ruled us with a rod of rigid iron. For 15 minutes every night, while sheep and heifers munch, our lives are canned and served up. 
then repeated after lunch. And every Sunday morning, in between the toast and roast, they regurgitate the pieces that upset us all the most. It took us by surprise at first that someone had the power to take us over daily for a quarter of an hour, to turn Charles into somebody obsessed with stags and sex, while Judy married Mark, who sadly died of sound effects. For nothing helps the ratings like a sudden ghastly death, so when a batch of scripts arrive, we read with bated breath, How are you, Brian? says Jennifer. Thank God it says I'm fine. But have you checked the slashing knife on your new combine? For people seldom realize that all the Ambridge greenery is liberally scattered with lethal farm machinery. You can leap from burning buildings and emerge with only bruises. But when an actor meets a tractor, the actor always loses. It's frightening being an archer, for someone writes your life, writes your husband, writes your children, writes your nightmare of a wife. So Brian toyed with Caroline, then slummed with what Madonna would have called a mother tucker. And now once more he's hungry, forget the aftermath away, to Brussels to eat mussels and leap on Siobhan Hathaway. Years past, Schuler in the vet's arms was trying to think was a good take refuge with each other in real life. It's not quite so exhausting just playing man and wife. A week or two back, I was listening to Paddy O'Connell on uh, his breakfast program on a Sunday. And he mentioned this man who suffered from dementia. And this man, Paul Harvey, who had been a fine musician and teacher all his life, was given four notes. And from that, he drifted into this most wonderful, haunting, melodic tune. And it's become a number one. It's been recorded by the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra with a wonderful arrangement by Daniel Wibley. And so for my Christmas choice, four notes, Paul's tune by the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. bent on being a classical actress, nothing newer than Pirandello, that sort of thing. You always remember your bad reviews. Patricia Green played it as if she was more at home on the hockey field than the boudoir. <laughs> that was the Oxford Mail. I've never forgotten it. At my drama school, we had six classes in microphone technique in the third year. I went along to my first one and the tutor said, you sound like a fairy in a hockey boots. So you will never broadcast. So I didn't go to the other five. And I was doing the classical drama when I had a phone call from Tony Shrine who said, will you come and audition? And I said, no, I can't do it. And he said, no, do come. He said, you won't be the only one there. So, and he said the magic words. He said, it's seven guineas an episode. And I was getting seven pounds a week in my classical theatre so everybody else said you must go and try the director rang me up and said come along and, and, and I said what's it about and he said well it, it's a sexy blonde in a tea tent really I, I can't really tell you any more than that so I went along and and all the others were proper radio actresses and there were five of them and I was the six and they were all doing I represent the household drudge which is a blah 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 blah, blah. And I went in and did, I represent the household drudge. You see, I, I was doing sexy blonders, I thought. 
And because I was different, I got the part. And they said to me, it's just for six weeks. So I had no backstory or anything because they really weren't expecting me to stay. I was just going to be a bit of fluff on the side for Philip, who was just getting over the death of Grace. And, you know, it was six weeks. And I said, well, I can't do it now because I'm going on a European tour with these plays. And they said, we'll wait for you. And they have never said anything as kind as that ever again. I think I'm the longest person who's been in it now. I really hadn't done any broadcasting, so I didn't know about approaching. I walked towards Norman and, no, 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 he said, you speak while you walk approaching, you see. And I said, OK. So I think it was the second broadcast I did, and the script said she throws a cup of coffee over him. And I picked up a glass of water, which was there, and threw it over Norman. And it, and it, it ran down his glasses, all over his script. I mean, I was that bad, truly. I once ate an apple on the mic. It was a Granny Smith, and I, I practically deafened half the crew. I came into the kitchen in the early days. She'd had two children very quickly, and then two more. And it was they all came in for breakfast, all these workers. And so I spent most of my time at the mic uh, cooking high cholesterol breakfasts. So certainly, Jill's place was absolutely in the kitchen. I don't think she ever came out of it, really. Well, there's a sink behind you, which also comes as a swimming pool. There's a, there's a rickety table in front of you and then a mic and several chairs... And it's never big enough to take all the people in the kitchen. In my head, there is a big old oak table taking up the middle of the room and a very nice... It's an arga. So Joe's got an arga. And, um, you know, we've got something you could do a slice of bacon on, but no bacon, of course. You know. We have other things. We have bread soaked in water and that sort of thing. During lockdown... The book I read first was Hilary Mantel, and it got so that I didn't want to finish it because I didn't want him to die. I knew he was going to die, of course. And so I was so into it. And I absolutely can't bear the thought of Henry VIII now. What a monster he was. So I didn't think you'd want Cromwell and Henry VIII. So I thought, well, what, what is nearer to Ambridge than that? And I thought, well, what about Cold Comfort Farm? I read it years ago when I was still at school and she suddenly has to find somewhere to live. And being Flora, she doesn't go for the easy option. She goes for the worst sounding place in the world. And it's full of more sad, lonely people. And it's dirty. I mean, the little mop comes because Adam stirs the porridge pot which is filthy and is overflowing and it and he stirs it with these twigs and of course she's a fairly fastidious person as Flora so that's why the mop appears. Uh, I, I love cluttering the dishes. I'm, I use that all the time at home now. So I've chosen a piece from Stella Gibbons' Cold Comfort Farm. Not really like Ruth and David's farm but there you go. Adam came into the kitchen. Flora said to him, Oh, Adam, here's your little mop. I got it in Howling this afternoon. Look, isn't it a nice little one? Try it and see. For a second, she thought he would dash it from her hand, but gradually, as he stared at the little mop, his expression of fury changed to one more difficult to read. It was indeed rather a nice little mop, white wood with a little waist right at the tip, its head of soft white threads, and a little loop of fine red string with which to hang it up. Adam cautiously put out his finger and poked at it. "'Tis mine? Aye, I mean, yes. It's yours, your very own. Do take it. He took it between his finger and thumb and stood gazing at it. His gnarled fingers foamed around the handle. Oi, tis mine, he muttered. 
no house, no coin, and yet tis mine, my little mop. He undid the thorn twig, which fastened the bosom of his shirt, and thrust the mop within. But then he withdrew it again and replaced the thorn. My little mop. Yes, it's to clatter the dishes with, said Flora firmly, suddenly foreseeing a new danger on the horizon. Nay, protested Adam, tis too pretty to clatter those great old dishes with. I mun do that with the thorn twigs, they'll serve. I'll keep my little mop in the shed, along with our pointless and our feckless. They might eat it, suggested Flora. Aye, so they might. Well, I mun hang it up by its little red string above the dishwashing bowl. Never. Put my little pretty in that good old greasy washing up water. Oi, tis prettier nor apple blues, my little mop. And shuffling across the kitchen, he hung it carefully on the wall above the sink and stood for some time admiring it. Flora, justifiably irritated, went crossly out for a walk. My name's Ben Norris. I play Ben Archer in The Archers and I am Paddy's grandson. Well, Jill's grandson. <laughs> I really love working with Paddy because I'm 10 years older than Ben. But weirdly, it's, it's, I guess it's allowed me to re-experience some of those rites of passage that you go through as an adolescent and a young adult and take them a bit less for granted. I don't have any of my grandparents left anymore and my gran, well rather Jill, reminds me so much of my gran right down to the lemon drizzle cake. I know that sounds bizarre because it's a, a radio drama and we only spend a tiny portion of our lives in that universe but I don't know, there's something really nostalgic and really homely about doing those scenes with Paddy, well with Jill and then actual Paddy is a right hoot and much more mischievous than some listeners would guess if they hear her her on-air personality, and I, I just love it. I just think she's amazing. She's been such a great kind of mental figure almost and, and welcoming figure uh, to me in the cast. I think probably if, if Ben was located anywhere, may, maybe it would be The Orchard, where him and Jill had that conversation about lineage and family, and where the bees are, where the hen house is. Because they drop a lot of the sound effects in live to do as much work as they can sort of in the moment, you do get these really rich soundscapes and, 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 you know, if you're ushering some cows through a gate, yes, the gate will be an ironing board that someone is rattling, but the cows' noises will be there and, I don't know, it's, it's very easy to sink into that world. That's what I say to my housemates, I don't say I'm going to Birmingham to do the arches, I say I'm going to Ambridge. It does feel like that because, yes, you're in Birmingham, but then when you go into the mailbox and you go into the studio, I mean, it's literally very quiet, because it has to be, but there's something quite sort of peaceful and spacious about it. Obviously, you know, it, it is an imaginative leap, but, but there's a lot of things in place. It's there to help you kind of disappear into the countryside completely. So outside of Ambridge, I am a writer and, and an actor in other things when those other things come along. But yes, I, I, I'd say the kind of the bread and butter is that I write. I write scripts and I write poems. Caroline is a massive favourite. She's an amazing writer. She's an amazing teacher. So yeah, I, I, I knew I wanted to to pick a poem of hers. She just won the forward prize for her last collection, The Air Year, which, which this is from. I've been lucky enough to have been in many workshops with her now, and I, I always feel incredibly energized and inspired when I leave them, as well as a bit like I've been hit over the head with a stick a million times, but in a great way, in a kind of, it's very bracing. I don't know, life affirming. I don't know, I wanted to pick something that speaks to Ben's idea that he's constantly falling in love with someone. So I've picked this poem and also somewhere I am in my life at the moment. It's, it's about feeling like, although academically you know that other people allegedly have fallen in love before, in the moment of feeling it you're like, guys, I don't know if, if you know what's going on here but this is the most amazing feeling in the world, and uh, I'm pretty sure that no one's ever felt like this, okay? So I'm just going to tell you about it, <laughs> and I, I just love, I love the urgency of it. This is Surrealism for Beginners, by Caroline Bird. We're trapped inside a movie, apparently. 
Last month, the grand secret was disclosed to us via these giant faces in the sky, claiming to be producers benevolently dropping by to let us know we were characters trapped inside their movie, and that every decision we made from now on would be in the script, and therefore wish too much or get overly self-critical. Some of us were villains, some bit parts, some heroes, but everyone was necessary for the story and important in their own way. Then the sky went blank, and everyone turned to each other and made that sound crowds make after receiving unexpected news. Hubbub, hubbub. We're in a movie! Of course! People kept shouting. It all makes sense now! So that's why my shoes don't come off. So that's why I'm always losing money on the same horse. So that's why I gel my hair like a vampire. I am a vampire! I knew I looked too young to be a grandma, said my grandma. What am I? 38? They all seemed so reassured, so validated. The next day, they resumed their roles with gusto. The greengrocer started throwing apples at children as a gesture of goodwill and then winking. My auntie began consciously bustling through doorways. Tramps cut the fingers off their gloves, practiced saying, God bless us all, and then coughing in chorus. Nothing really changed, exactly. Reality just got more pronounced like someone underlined the word normal in our stage directions, you know? But I'm not buying it. Trapped inside a movie? What is this, surrealism for beginners? Yes, I keep bursting into song whenever the streetlights come on. Yes, I keep chasing the girl of my dreams across New York. Yes, we walk hand in hand along the moonlit river as the disembodied voice of Ella Fitzgerald drifts through the glowing blossom trees. But these are merely facts. And not, I don't care what the producers in the sky say. They're not in my heart. They don't know the subtle earthquake of her eyes. I don't care if there's a script with these lines written in it or some douchebags throwing popcorn at a screen. I can't see a screen. I can't see anything but her. And I need to tell her how I feel. And my boat leaves in the morning, and she's on the other side of Manhattan. I'm searching. Just carry on, just carry on. So this is Holding Hands by The Magic Lantern. Less to do with Ben and more to do with this Ben. Um, and, and just the, the way that the pandemic has kind of stopped us from seeing our nearest and dearest. I probably won't have seen my dad for a full year by the time this goes out. Hey, Dad, if you're listening, you're probably not. Um, and... Yeah, I think that just that idea of sort of waiting and and knowing that it's coming and it's going to be special when when it does and kind of reaching out, literally holding hands across across time and space. I think it's really beautiful. So I'm trying to But the world goes on Yes, the world goes on Yes, the world goes on One
I'm Katie Redford and I play Lily Pargeter in The Archers. My favourite place is Lower Loxley in one of the living rooms, the main living room, next to a roaring fire and the Christmas tree is just behind me and it's lit up and it's extremely cosy in here. Just because I'm not actually standing in Lower Loxley, spoilers, um, it doesn't mean I don't know what the colours of the wall are or what I can see from Lily's bedroom window. I think for me that's really important because the imagination is all we have, I think, when we do radio drama. It's luxurious. It's this beautiful manor house. That's how I see it. With lots of different rooms and lots of history. It's very different from where I grew up. You know, I had Top of the Pops Christmas special and Box of Quality Streets. She's quite far removed from what I know. <laughs> you know, I didn't have my own ice rink. I think Lily is a good egg. I think she's not had the easiest of upbringings, despite growing up in quite a rich family and probably having everything that she needs. I think losing a dad as young as she did can't have been easy at all. So I think she sort of had to step up and be this sort of parental figure I think she takes on, even though her mum is a mother and, and a father all in one to her and Freddie. But I think... Lily is very mature for her age, a little too mature sometimes. I think she needs to let go and have a bit of fun. I always knew I wanted to be an actress ever since I was about four, I'd say, and I would just put on shows for anyone who was willing to watch. I remember once deciding to put on a Spice Girls show for the neighbourhood and I hand wrote all these invitations, popped them through all the doors of our neighbours, rehearsed this show, included costume changes and all sorts. Anyway, on the day of the show, I got home from school, I must have been about eight or nine at this point, and my mum was rushing around doing the dinner, it was a busy evening, I remember her being quite flustered and the doorbell went and about ten neighbours turned up to watch the Spice Girls show and I remember just the colour from my mum's face slowly draining and I'd not told her about it at all. I don't know why, I just failed to mention it and I just remember her watching all these neighbours pile into our house, neighbours that we barely even knew, and her losing the will to live slightly. And then I had the audacity after the performance, which took about an hour, um, which actually was quite awkward maybe thinking about it because it was just this group of neighbours in our living room watching me perform the entire first Spice Girl album and then yeah I had the audacity afterwards to announce there'd be tea and biscuits in the kitchen and my mum I think she spent the rest of my childhood scared that I would invite the neighbours round for album number two. Kate Bush's December Will Be Magic Again is not the most traditional of Christmas songs and whenever I heard this song I imagined this eerie snowy woods and I'd just sort of fling myself around the lounge and I had no idea what the lyrics were Every now and then I'd just sing the word December. But I just used to love putting on shows at home and my imagination would just make the scenario so much fancier than it actually was, hence the Spice Girl story. I love ghost stories and I think that there's a real eeriness to this song. But again, I think working in radio, having to use your imagination, having to create a room around you that's not there... I think from listening to songs like this that created such a vision for me, I think it, it all it all ties in together really. Like the 
My name's uh, Trevor Harrison, and I play Eddie Grundy in The Archers. When I first played Eddie, I was so pleased to get the role, and I was told at the time, would I be free for six months if I got the part? And I thought, six months work, that would be brilliant. <laughs> I've been playing Eddie now uh, this year for 41 years. I've changed with Eddie. In those early days, Eddie was very much a sort of always up to scams, always doing this, that and the other. But over the years, he has mellowed. And I love Eddie. And I think he's also got a sensitive uh, side to him, which some people never thought Eddie would have. But, but he has. And so I've kind of grown up with him as I've grown up with uh, the family <laughs> of the Grundys as well, which has been fascinating. And of course, 2021, a very special year for the Archers, seven years old and Eddie is also the same age as the programme so Eddie will be 70 in 2021 as well. It, it seemed at one time that the Grundys were always the like, equivalent to Shakespeare's rude mechanicals. If there was some a heavy storyline going on then it would be nice to sort of have a, a bit of a Grundy thing happening in uh, alongside it you know to, to lighten it up a bit but over the years of course the Grundys have had their own tragedy as well so as an actor I've been very, very lucky in The Archers to play both comedy uh, and, to an extent, tragedy as well. Being in The Archers, I, it is like being in one big family. Um, we, we don't work with each other every day, so it's nice when we do catch up, you know. Uh, we may not be but see someone for months and, you're, oh, you know, how's so-and-so getting on and how's your son, how's your daughter? But also, it, it, there's a bit of a clique in a certain extent with, with families because the Grundys also do tend to... We, we don't ignore everybody else, but we do tend to stick together. There is a kind of Grundy clique when uh, some, my son's coming. It's all right, son, all right, Dad. <laughs> so we have got a bit of a, you know, a, a solidarity amongst, uh, amongst the Grundy family, which I think is nice. I've been very uh, lucky in the Archers working with so many uh, lovely people and many talented actors. One of them was... Uh, the lovely actor Edward Kelsey, Ted, who played uh, my father, Joe Grundy. We, uh, to a certain extent, almost become like uh, father and son. We used to be a little bit, we used to think like Steptoe and son together with some of the Joe and Eddie scenes. And over the years, we got to know exactly what way someone would deliver their line. I would know exactly how Ted would do it. And he would sometimes know exactly how I would deliver the line. And it was just a great honour to work with him. And we kind of developed a special bond, a special radio father and son relationship. Outside the Archers, we used to do agricultural shows together as well. And uh, I just loved Ted so much. A great character. And when he sadly passed away, Joe Grundy, of course, um, sadly passed away as well. And as Eddie, I, I found uh, Joe... And it was like sort of two deaths, one for Ted and one for Joe. But I know that Joe will always be remembered in Ambridge. And I know that many, many listeners will remember his humour. Uh, sometimes his, 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 his naughty wickedness. But uh, he was just a, a great character. And full, of course, of country wisdom. This is a, a special piece I would love to uh, read now with great memories of the wonderful uh, Joe Grundy. It's a, a special piece written by the, uh, one of the Archer's uh, writers, Adrian Flynn. And uh, it's my pleasure to read it as Eddie, passing on the wisdom of Joe. My dad, Joe Grundy, said he learned one of the most valuable lessons of his life one Christmas when he was a kiddie. It meant so much that later he tried dinning it into his own children, me and my brother Alf. I'm passing it on now in case it's of any use to you. 
It happened when he was very small and had to attend Sunday school at St Stephen's every week. He worked that keen on it, but Grandpa George and Grandma Mary liked him out the way Sunday afternoons. So off he'd trot, more or less cleaned up, with strict instructions to be on his best behaviour in front of the Reverend Mortimer. Only this one Sunday, a month before Christmas, it weren't the Reverend taking charge. To hear Dad years later, you'd think the new teacher, Dorothy Daniels, was a dragon in human form. She had a look that could freeze blood and a tongue sharp enough to slice bread. When she announced there was going to be a Christmas treat, she told the children to bring in an apne each week beforehand to pay for it. Dad's heart sank. He knew his parents didn't have the money for extras. Well, each Sunday... Dad made a different excuse for not bringing in his apney. At the last class, Dorothy Daniels painted a picture of all the treats the children had in store. Mince pies, sarsaparilla and enough prizes in the brand tub for every child to take one home. Plenty for everyone, except for poor Joe Grundy, she said, who hadn't paid his tuppence. Course, on the day of the treat, Dad couldn't keep away. He stood outside the church hall, pulling faces at the ones going in for their slap-up fun, all except him. That's when he spotted a tray of mince pies, cooling by the open church hall window. Well, you can guess what happened next. But just as he'd reached up to help himself, Dorothy Daniel stepped out, saw what he was doing and gave him a look the Gorgons would have been proud of. Terrified, he ran off could hardly breathe through all the mince pie he'd stuffed in his mouth. By the time he reached home, he was in a dreadful state. The rest of that day, and most of the night, he was in agony, waiting for a knock at the door. It got so bad, half a dozen times he nearly told his parents what he'd done, just to get the waiting over. He was an even worse bag of nerves, sitting with them at Christmas service next morning. Dorothy Daniels, only two pews ahead. When it finally finished, he tried to hurry his parents off home, but a dragonish roar called them back. Dad thought his life was over, until Dorothy patted him on the head and said it was a great shame he'd missed the Sunday school treat, then took a white serviette with holly edging out of her handbag, gave him two wrapped-up mince pies and wished the whole family a happy Christmas. Dad looked up, amazed that even her flinty, dragonish heart had been melted by the season of goodwill. That taught him an important lesson. At that moment, he realised you should never, ever confess to anything at Christmas, because you can usually get away with murder then. Now, I'm not saying I agree with my father 100%. I'll just point out, my wife, Clary, and me... I've had plenty of Christmases that wouldn't have been so peaceful if I hadn't followed Dad's advice and kept my mouth shut at the right time. Whether it helps you get through the festive season with your loved ones unscathed is entirely a matter for your own conscience. My name is Ryan Kelly and I play Jazza McCreary in The Archers. And my favourite place, unlike Eddie's, is the bull. Eddie likes the cider shed, he likes it more rustic. Although Jazza probably has a partiality for the cider shed as well, anywhere he can get booze from, to be honest. This year hasn't been easy as regards sort of socialising and things. As part of it, you know, I, I miss being able to go to the pub for a pint and being convivial and being around lots of people. I, I don't have a picture because I don't have a mind's eye. I'm being totally blind and I was born this way. You know, I don't even see when I'm dreaming. I have a mind's ear, a mind's hands, a mind's sort of other senses, and a, a mind's sort of sixth sense sometimes, presence. But for me, it would be all about what the bull feels like, you know. Lovely, convivial, quiet country bar. It's more about the smells and the atmosphere. So you'd have a lovely log fire, people's scents, and carpet on the floor, I think. I mean, I've always listened to audio ever since I can think. You know, I can I can remember being put in front of a tape recorder for an afternoon, and I really enjoyed it. And I used to I used to go home and pretend I was doing the books. My family were always there for me. I've never known anything but love and, and goodness from them. 
I was always away from them for long periods of time, you know, from the age of five, because I was at special school, because I was at boarding school. And then I went to college, a college for the blind for three years after that, then the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School, where I had to sort of learn to fend for myself and live on my own and do digs and things. And towards the end of that time, I got together with my girlfriend, who is now my wife, uh, Sonia, and I got a phone call at the edge of a very busy road um, from one of the directors of the Archers, saying that um, we'd like you to audition for the... And I, I was so distracted and, and filled with sort of fizz and joy about this, I actually told my dog to go forward into a load of traffic. Thankfully, he had more sense and better eyesight than me too. <laughs> the lovely thing about it was when I got there, you know, I was a bit starstruck as well because I've listened to the Archers since I was 11. Carol Boyd, who plays Linda Snell. If I could have seen her, I'd have gone, oh, can I have your autograph, please? I was really starstruck meeting her because she read loads of story tapes. I mean, when I was a little tot, I mean, she was brilliant. And I met her and I was like, oh my God. But the lovely thing about the Archers is we're like a family. We get on really well. In fact, we get on better than a family do because you tend to get spite, especially around about Christmas time, times like that, you know. Thank God I've got a guide dog. I mean, I've had... Um, He's getting near the end now, though, Marley. This is my, he's my third guide dog. I've had guide dogs since I was 18. He needs to retire. Um, he needs to go to a place where he can not think about being a guide dog, not think about being responsible for me. You know, he needs to relax and grow old gracefully, if you will. All guide dogs know when they're working. You know, you pick the harness up and the attitude changes. I'm not saying they're not well-disciplined when they're off harness. You know, they're like very well-trained pets. But the minute that harness goes on, or the minute you pick it up, that alertness goes up. I went to see my first guide dog who had retired, and it, he took a while to remember me, actually. Oh, it's you, right, okay. And because he was my first guide dog, I think he was probably my favourite, because we were students. I, well, I was a student, and he became a student kind of dog. He's even in the old Bristol Vic yearbook. But I went to see him, and I took my new guide dog with me, Hadley, and I took the harness out, and I've Benson came up right beside Hadley as if to say, right, ready for work then. Um, and that was, yeah, I think even harder than him retiring. When I um, first started with the Archers, um, the, the director who was in charge of me, she said to me, can you read Braille over a microphone? And actually, we'd done some experiments with that in Bristol. And you can't read Braille over a mic. It makes a noise like a Geiger counter. It's, it's like... So you'd have that sort of ticker tape Geiger counter noise running all the way through the background. I can listen to speech and learn it that way. But the funny thing is, they go fairly quickly. On the, way, on the train home, when I'm going home, you know, from Birmingham, I've forgotten at least a third of them. But I've had a situation once where we had to re-record the a couple of scenes and they came back to me within about 10 minutes, you know, properly within 10 minutes. So it's pretty, the process is pretty quick. Uh, the poem I've chosen for today is Old Lang Syne by Robert Burns. The reason I've chosen it is partly because Jazza is always involved in Burns Night. Even if he's not in the show, he's always in, they always talk about him, at least. Was Jazza coming with his pipes then? Yeah, you know, that sort of thing. Another part of it is the sort of, it's the 70th anniversary of the Archers this time. So, you know, it's about long times past and about friends long time ago. We've had a crazy year this year and the fact that you can't be with people i thought it would be nicer to sing it i tried to get as close to the old melody as i could so this now is old lang syne by robert burns should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind should old acquaintance be forgot and old lang syne for old lang syne my dear for old lang syne we'll tack a cup o kindness yet for old lang syne and surely he'll be your pine stoop and surely i'll be mine and we'll tack a cup o kindness yet for old lang syne for old lang syne my dear for old lang syne 
We'll tak a cup o kindness yet for old lang syne. We twa hae ran aboot the braes and pu'd the gowans fine, but we've wandered many a weary fit sin old lang syne. I we twa hae paddled in the burn. Frae morning sun till dawn, but seas between us brady roared, sin old lang syne. For old lang syne, my dear, for old lang syne, we'll tak a cup o kindness yet, for old lang syne. And thar's a hand, my trusty fear, and gies a hand o' oh, thine, and we'll tak a recht get wally wall for all lang syne. Hello, I'm Susie Riddell and I play Tracy Horobin. People think of Tracy as a loud mouth, probably slightly uncouth, no filter, but actually she is extremely personable, vivacious, interested in people, good communicator. She's very open and friendly. She's actually perfect for a reception role at a sort of esteemed establishment as Grey Gables. And it gave her a friendship with two of the most fantastic people in Ambridge, Linda Snell and Oliver Sterling. And I think that was a sort of inspired move by the um, production team, really, to put Tracy in that environment. She just doesn't stop, does she? She's now captain of the cricket team. She is keeping that household going. Gary doesn't come out of his room, I don't think, very much. Dad just sits in front of the telly and the kids are at school and, and being generally teenage-like. So, yeah, she keeps them all going. And she's, she's on hand for any... Um, disaster that happens in the family you know to dispense advice and mop up tears and stuff uh, which she's very good at as well so yeah she's she's a whirlwind I would say I adore her I can't I just think she's so good-hearted and big-hearted and she has such joy in life and in what she does and in in her interactions with people I just think she's wonderful and she just really goes for it. I mean, she can, you know, she says what she thinks and she does what she says. And I think that's that's a great thing and also something that can, you know, rub people up the wrong way sometimes. But essentially, I think she's an incredibly good person and certainly good to have on your side. I think she's fab and I'd like to be more like her, really. I'd like to just say what I think. <laughs> I think I can learn from her in just being more... It's being it's being a bit more brave, I think. I actually joined the Archers a very long time ago, when I was eleven, and I played an entirely different character. I played Kate Aldridge at that point. I hadn't got a clue. I didn't know actually what the Archers was when I was auditioning. My family never listened. They did once I was in it, and uh, I went along to the audition and got through for a recall and ended up playing this fantastic teenage tearaway for five years and uh, she was even less like me than Tracy Horvin. <laughs> I was such a swat and Kate was such a tearaway. I was 11 and she was 12 and her first line was um, she had to go into the bull and ask for a lager and lime please and uh, this was shocking to me because <laughs> the thought of going to a pub having a lager. Good grief. So it was great fun to play. I think the Archers is very special because it's so beautifully created and made and because it's been going on for 70 years, it is an entire, it exists, doesn't it? It is another place that exists in parallel to, to the world that we're in. It's an anchor in a reality, an invented reality, but it's always there and these people are our friends and our family and we know, yeah, we know them so well. That grounding, to have, to have had that throughout the pandemic when everything was just completely being swept from under our feet wasn't it it was like you just the whole of what we knew as normal just went in a day and it was incredibly unsettling 
for me as a listener, I found I, I loved the fact that it was that Ambridge was still there. I've picked this. It's an excerpt from Christmas Time by John Clare because it's so evocative of the countryside Christmas that we kind of all imagine. Because Christmas is always, I don't know, I always imagine it in the countryside, even though I've never lived in the countryside. I'm from Birmingham and now live in London. I'm very much a city girl. But Christmas is snow-covered hills and sheep cowering in barns, robins on trees. And it's Ambridge, really. And I was, I was kind of thinking, actually, for me, being in the Arches, being lucky enough to play a character in the Arches and to get to go to Ambridge, it is a bit like Christmas every time I go. And it's that familiarity and cosiness. And I get to go to the countryside and be in these open spaces, even though I'm in a studio. It honestly feels like I am there and I'm somewhere else. And this John Clare poem is just so lovely. It just speaks of Christmas and comfort and how I imagine Ambridge was in, you know, Dan and Doris's day and, and, and really still kind of is. I love it. Christmas is come, and every hearth makes room to give him welcome now. E'en want will dry its tears in mirth and crown him with a holly bough. Though tramping neath a winter sky, o'er snowy paths and rhymy styles, the housewife sets her spinning by to bid him welcome with her smiles. Each house is swept the day before, and windows stuck with evergreens, and snow is besomed from the door, and comfort crowns the cottage scenes. Gilt holly with its thorny pricks, and yew and box with berries small, these deck the unused candlesticks and pictures hanging by the wall. Neighbours resume their annual cheer, wishing with smiles and spirits high, glad Christmas and a happy year to every morning passer-by. Milkmaids their Christmas journeys go, accompanied with favoured swain, and children pace the crumpling snow to taste their granny's cake again. I've chosen A Spotless Rose, which is such a beautiful Christmas piece. This particular version is sung by the City of London Choir, and I'm a member of the City of London Choir. It's where I met my husband on my very first day of recording as Tracy. At the end of that day, which was a, a wonderful day and, and very exciting and nerve-wracking, my husband actually proposed to me. And I always feel that Tracy has been with me all these big life experiences and she's there, she's there with me and I'm lucky to have her really. The peace and the way the song makes me feel, that's kind of how I feel about the arches really. I think it's, it is a special thing and I feel very lucky to have that in my life and to experience it along with so many other people.
Spotless Rose by Herbert Howells, ending with Great Pleasure at Christmas, which was presented by members of the cast of The Archers and produced by Mary Ward-Lowry. It was a BBC Audio Bristol production for Radio 4.